Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry. I am Noel, and not joining me this week are Alex and Julia, who are currently moving across the great northern lands of Canada, and we wish them well and we wish them luck. This month, I am joined for a very special episode by two of our previous guests. We have Mr. Kevin O'Shea. You know, the Ad Rocks are really totally spamming my Instagram feed right now, so it's like they're almost here, but in my phone. Oh, yes. And we're also joined by Julie Sidor. Hey, hey. Comic artist from snowflamecomic.com and Jay Sidor on Tumblr. Just going to throw that out. Is that how your last name is pronounced? Yep, Sidor. I've never heard it pronounced. I've only seen it in text. It's completely phonetically illogical. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing that I didn't try to introduce you. Yeah. First time I saw it, that's how I thought it was. Yeah, yeah. It's usually people go for the Sidor. Yeah, that sounds kind of cool. Well, it's probably because I used to be into the old, you know, face on Mars thing in Sidonia. Or no, 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 or no, what you need to think is Max von Sidow. Max von Sidow. Said just like that. Nice. I hope he doesn't say it the other way, but yeah, okay, (laughs) okay, we're good. (laughs) Okay, so that's where people can find you online. Kevin, where can people find you online? Same places as always. Okay. (laughs) I'm just generally kind of around, not really doing any kind of big things anymore. I used to be doing all sorts of things, and now I'm not really doing all sorts of things, which is a lot better for my mental health Mm. and everybody else's mental health. Check my sidebar. He's involved with a lot of that. (laughs) Many good projects. So we are here to discuss the film Philadelphia Experiment. Just to throw out there, have either of you seen this movie before? I had not. I think it's one of those ones where I probably saw it on TV and then later assumed it was a fever dream or something. (laughs) There's a lot of movies like that for me. It does feel kind of like a fever dream, doesn't it? Where I'm like, I've been here. I've lived with these dudes oh, yeah. and their struggle, but I don't remember what's going to happen next. So eh, make of that what you will. I know, again, I had seen part of it on TV, too. Actually, as recently as just like five years ago. But it's like every time I catch it, I just catch the middle part. I never catch the beginning. I never catch the end. Always just the middle part. Mm-hmm. So I never knew how this film started or ended. Before we get into the film, is the actual urban legend of the Philadelphia Experiment something either of you have been familiar with? I had heard it before. I couldn't tell you where. Not so much on my end, but I did research it for this movie. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I remember it because back in my teens, I was big into conspiracy theory and urban legends, and that was always one of the more popular ones. I was actually kind of surprised researching it, how little that urban legend was actually based on. It was all just letters and an annotated book from one guy. (laughs) Mm-hmm. So it was an interesting thing as Laura and I were watching the episode and she told me that my brother-in-law, who everyone is insisting that we refer to as G-Money, had said, oh, I'd heard of that movie. That's the one based off the thing that actually happened, right? Yeah. Okay. It's a documentary. It's interesting how it's become this very wide, it's one of those urban legends that it, it is a kind of catchy idea, so it's not that surprising to see how much it's caught on. But its origins are just literally with just one guy who just said some things and nothing that ever been researched about him has ever panned out into anything that actually happened. And yet it's become like one of the centerpieces of World War II conspiracy theories and all that stuff. And to be fair, one, that's what happens with a lot of things is it oh, just yeah. starts with one little thing and it just like goes viral. And also, God, the military gets up to some stuff. So if you true. kind of hear someone say, oh, they're trying to make battleships, you know, invisible in World War II. I'm not going to say no. Everyone's like, yeah, oh, of course. Yeah, I'm sure they did. I heard about the fire bats they tried to do. Yeah, invisible ship. That makes sense. That makes more sense than fire bats, so of course I'll believe it. (laughs) Oh, yeah, but it's it's usually, you know, when one of those things starts to take ground, you start to get other people kind of coming in out of the woodwork. After the movie came out, you had one guy come out and said, yeah, I was the soldier. I was the lead (laughs) character in the movie, despite the fact that the actual plot of the movie is completely invented for the movie. Yeah. There was an actual thing called degaussing, where they basically just coiled cable around a ship and ran an electromagnetic charge through it to try to make it invisible to magnetic mines. 
but it would just upset the magnetic field. It didn't make it cloaking, it didn't make it invisible to radar, it didn't cause people to phase into the walls of the ship. And that wasn't even like a top secret experiment. It was something that they kind of did regularly for about a year or so. Okay. So it's like, I can see how that kind of then built into someone building off of that. And do they know if that has any scientific ground or is it kind of one of those things that also caught on like a sports season beard? Again, it only ran for a year because it wasn't really that successful. Mm -hmm. Because magnetic mines, they just explode whenever something enters their magnetic field. It was supposed to kind of like repel that. Basically, they said all it did was give a lot of people headaches and sore fillings. Okay. So yeah, a lot of this happened with this one guy. He named himself sometimes Carlos Allende and sometimes Carl Allen. He basically took this one guy's UFO book and just jotted in all these notations in the margins, sometimes as conversations between three different people, one of whom claimed to be an alien, and then mailed that to the Navy. And then the Navy mailed it back to the UFO guy saying, I think this is yours. And then in the 70s, it really caught on because George Simpson and Neil Berger used it as the basis for a novel called Thin Air. And then a couple years later, Carl Burlitz and William L. Moore put out the book, The Philadelphia Experiment, Project Invisibility, which despite claiming to be like a true examination is mostly just material wholeheartedly ripped off from the novel. Oh, wow. And then adding just a lot of speculation about what if it was time travel? What if this happened, this happened, this happened? And that's actually the book, though, that was licensed for the movie. Dang, okay. So it's a story that grew in the telling and then they sold it as a movie, hmm. which happens. So the Philadelphia Experiment was released on August 3rd of 1984. And I forgot for the last couple episodes that Box Office Mojo actually goes all the way back to 1982. So I actually have box office information on this movie. It opened at number 10 in the box office. Mm -hmm. Right above it in the box office was Never Ending Story, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, The Karate Kid, Gremlins, Purple Rain, and Ghostbusters, which was number one for its third week in a row. Oh, no. That is a train of movies you don't want to be behind. But despite the low rank, it actually held that spot for several weeks in a row, still pulling in a million per week. And I can't find the budget, but it did ultimately do eight million domestic. So it wasn't a huge bomb. And I know it did really well on video and TV to the point where it still plays on TV recently. I actually just saw it in the listings a couple of days ago. Probably did the whole HBO, see it every five years for like three weeks straight in a row and then never see it again for like 10 years. Then as the cable channels like TBS and USA and WGN popped up, this was perfect content filler for them. Oh, this totally feels like a WGN Sunday afternoon movie. And then that success is actually how we ended up with the sequel. I will get to that at the end of the episode. So regarding Carpenter's involvement in this film, I have a quote here from Carpenter himself. After we released The Fog, I had one more picture on my Avco embassy deal. I started writing The Philadelphia Experiment, which was a famous folktale about this World War II invisibility experiment in a Navy shipyard where their ship disappears. I had a great two-act movie, but no third act. I couldn't end it. Bob Rainey, who was the head of Avco, wanted another picture from me, so he asked what else I might have. So I reached down into the trunk and came up with this thing I'd written right out of film school called Escape from New York. So yes, the Philadelphia Experiment started production in the late 70s at Avco Embassy. I actually don't know if Carpenter wrote an initial script for it or was just working on a rewrite of an existing script, but his only credit on the finished film is executive producer. And I even have a draft of the screenplay. It's pretty much the shooting script. It just credits the four who are credited, not John Carpenter. So I don't know if the one that he actually was writing was the one that we have here. In the early 80s, Avco Embassy changed hands a bunch of times before ultimately being bought out by Coca-Cola. And somewhere in there, the project shifted over to New World, which had just started up again under new management after Roger Corman sold it off and founded New Horizons. The main producers of the film were Douglas Curtis and Joel B. Michaels, and this and Black Moon Rising, which we covered in the previous episode, are the only collaborations between the two. Curtis got to start producing and directing with indie horror films The Hazing and Sleeping Car, and his other works as a producer include I have no idea what this film is about, but just the title Nice Girls Don't Explode. The 18th Angel, Next Friday, Friday After Next, Save the Last Dance, National Lampoons Presents Replicate, All About the Benjamins, Freddy vs. Jason, Cellular, Shoot 'em Up, Sorority Row, and Shark Night 3D. That's about as varied as a career as George Miller. <laughs> is that Shark Night with a K? No. Oh. I see where you're going with that. I want that movie. To be honest, both of those are good. Shark Night. Isn't that something that Gail <laughs> Simone was writing at one point? Oh, if only. <laughs> a shark with a little helmet and a lance beneath one fin. God, that's sweet. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, we need to we need to pull it back, you guys. <laughs> oh man. Let's get back on track. 
Joel B. Michaels got his start in 1971 as the co-writer and producer of the biker exploitation flick The Peace Killers. As a producer, he quickly became a frequent partner of famed blockbuster producer Mario Casar, and his credits include The Silent Partner, The Changeling, The Amateur, Losing It, Universal Soldier, Stargate, Last of the Dogmen, Cutthroat Island, Basic Instinct 2, Terminator 3, Terminator Salvation, and Terminator the Sarah Connor Chronicles. And associate producer Peggy Brotman had previously filled that role on The Fog, as well as been a production assistant and member of the casting department on Escape from New York. She was actually uh, Deborah Hill's assistant and went off with her to do all of Deborah Hill's other movies. As I said, I don't know where Carpenter's work on the script fits into things, but as for the four credited writers, Wallace C. Bennett was a script supervisor on a handful of films like Blue Collar, Days of Heaven, and Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine. Hmm and wrote the films Welcome to Arrow Beach, The Silent Scream, Rage of Honor, and George, the last of which he also directed. Don Jacoby, a screenwriter I'm personally a fan of, first broke into the industry as a co-writer of Dan O'Bannon, whom hmm. listeners of this show might remember was John Carpenter's collaborator on Dark Star. Jacoby and O'Bannon wrote Blue Thunder, Life Force, Invaders from Mars, and the short-lived Blue Thunder TV series spinoff. And outside of his work with O'Bannon, Jacoby also wrote Death Wish 3, Arachnophobia, Double Team, Evolution, and will pop up again here down the road as the writer of John Carpenter's Vampires. William Gray was a frequent collaborator of exploitation director Paul Lynch, no relation to David, for whom he wrote Blood and Guts, Prom Night, Humongous, and Cross Country, and his other film credits include Black Moon Rising, The Changeling, and Eye for an Eye, The Abduction of Carrie Swenson, Killer Deal, and Killer Wave, as well as episodes of The Hitchhiker, In the Heat of the Night, Robocop, FX, Largo Winch, and Beastmaster. And Michael Jenauer wrote episodes of Hawaii Five-0 and The Hitchhiker, and the Jerry Lewis film Hardly Working, but his best-known works, at least to me, were the 80s Halloween TV specials Mr. Boogity and Bride of Boogity, hmm. which scared the shit out of me as a five-year-old. So anyways, after Carpenter left as a director, next up was Joe Dante, coming off of Piranha and the Howling. After he left this film, Dante was actually in talks to direct Halloween 3, but instead did Twilight Zone the movie, which began his numerous collaborations with Steven Spielberg. Then came Harley Kokolis, coming off of Battle Trucks Warlord of the 21st Century. He instead did Black Moon Rising. Then Jonathan Demme, who was coming off of Roger Corman exploitation flicks and quiet indie dramas, came in, and a few years after this, he went on to get multiple Oscar nominations for Married to the Mob, Silence of the Lambs, and the unrelated Philadelphia. So they ultimately settled on director Stuart Raffle, who got his start in the industry as an animal trainer and supervisor, which he transitioned into writing, producing, and directing nature adventure films like The Tender Warrior, When the North Wind Blows, The Adventures of the Wilderness Family, Across the Great Divide, The Sea Gypsies, Lost in Africa, The New Swiss Family Robinson, and Grizzly Falls, as well as bouncing off into other genres with High Risk, Ice Pirates, Mac and Me, Mannequin 2 on the Move, Tammy and the T-Rex, A Month of Sundays, and Standing Ovation, and he's recently looped back to nature films with the horror movies Survival Island, Croc, and Bad Girl Island. There's some odd credits <laughs> the people who worked on this We get some great titles this episode. Oh, wait till we get to the guy who made the remake. <laughs> I will be bringing that up at the end of the episode. But yeah, so this is from the director of Mac and Me and Bad Girl Island. Which, can't go wrong there. And no. uh, Mannequin 2. Mannequin 2 on the move. Pretty sure I've seen. I still need to see Ice Pirates. I hear so many things about Ice Pirates. I need to see oh, Ice Pirates. Oh, Ice Pirates. Okay. I'm ice sorry. Pirates. I was mishearing you. Ice for... Pirates. The movie needs conflict. Come on. <laughs> They're friendly pirates who just want to leap on ships and give people hugs. Yeah. They're the primary adversaries of Shark Knight. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that's all I have for production notes. Anyone have anything else they need to bring up before we jump into the synopsis? Mm -mm. Not unless we're talking about Shark Knight some more. No, no. I'm sure we're going to. <laughs> Shark Knight is one of those concepts that once you think of it, it doesn't go away. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> You're welcome. No, don't regret that. Do not regret Shark Knight. Okay, never, never. That is not a thing to regret. Yeah, no, it's child of my heart. So, in 1943, physicist James Longstreet oversees what's come to be known as the Philadelphia Experiment, where a Navy vessel, the USS Eldridge, uses a powerful electromagnetic generator in the hopes of rendering the ship invisible, both to radar and the naked eye. Unfortunately, it opens a rift in space-time and the entire ship disappears. In the 1980s, Longstreet oversees a revived attempt at the experiment, but this time it vanishes an entire town as another rip is open, creating a vortex between the two periods in time. 
Two of the sailors from 1943, David Herdig and Jim Parker, find themselves deposited in the strange alien world of the 1980s and are quickly forced on the run, especially when the flares of energy ripping out of Jim draw the attention of authorities, led by army man Major Clark, who reports to Longstreet. The two sailors kidnap Allison Hayes but quickly form a bond with her as she decides to help out, especially when the energy flares cause Jim to vanish altogether and David learns the fate of his late father. Trying to find a connection to his own time, David tracks down Jim's wife, only to find an elderly Jim still alive on their ranch, though he's come to believe the adventure he'd recently lived through in the current time was a mental break and he turns David away. David and Allison fall in love and decide to go directly to Longstreet, even as they continue to be pursued by Clark. In order to close the rift and prevent all of time and space from ripping apart, which has been visualized in these massive storms that are spreading all over the country, David needs to travel into the vortex and shut down the generator on the Eldridge. He says goodbye and does so, even reuniting with the gem of the past, but as the vortex fade, David jumps back into it, reuniting with Allison in the present, and they live happily ever after. Kevin, do you recommend the Philadelphia Experiment? In what context? Would you watch it again? Would you say other people should watch it? Here's the thing about the Philadelphia Experiment, and I say this having only seen it for the first time about 20 hours ago. It started off really strong and had a weird end, and I think it would be something that would be, as we discussed earlier, a fantastic Sunday afternoon WGN movie on TV, put it on as background noise. I think it's a fun movie. I don't know if I would recommend it anything beyond that. Okay. Julie, do you recommend the movie? I think I do. I think it's one of those stories of like two fun characters from completely different times slammed together and getting their interactions. And I don't know, I always think there's a place for that. And I thought a lot of that stuff was like really fantastic. So I don't know, I think it was a lot of fun. I do agree that it kind of got a little bit weaker towards the end, but I would recommend it. I ultimately don't recommend it, but I don't dislike the movie. It is an entertaining movie. I think it does start strong. I think the middle chunk has a lot of great ideas and stuff. But Carpenter couldn't figure out a third act, and it still feels like they couldn't figure out a third act, because they just graft on this whole storm and vortex and stuff, and it does kind of fall apart as it gets near the end. Even then, the stuff that's there, I found it kind of clunky and choppy, and I really didn't find there to be any chemistry between the two leads. It's a film that's almost there. Like, you have a lot of the right stuff. There's even some decent filmmaking on display. Some really great helicopter shots. Oh, yes. And it is a nice play on the urban legend. It does make good use of the actual Philadelphia Experiment story. I just don't think it quite pulled it off. Mm -hmm. Anyways, why don't we go ahead and shift into open discussion then? Why don't we just go ahead and talk about the lead here, Michael Pere, as David Herdig. Juana Stallone? Yeah, I mean, well, that's the thing is, there was this brief period there in the early 80s where someone saw him on Greatest American Hero, mm -hmm. where he played the kind of lunk-headed jock who was part of the lead character's classroom and said, he looks like John Travolta and Sylvester Stallone had a baby. Let's make this man a star. Because this was right in the period where both those guys were riding the heights of their stardom. You know, I can see that. And so they saw this guy and was like, there, he's both in one package. Okay. And so he got this, Eddie and the Cruisers, and Streets of Fire, none of which really took off. So he never became a, an A-list actor, but he's still a working actor. He continues to do like maybe a dozen films a year. Ooh. He's in almost every Uwe Boll movie. Okay. I'm so sorry. What do we think of him and his performance in the movie? Once you get past the uh, Sylvester Stallone voice, he was actually really good. That voice was pulling me out of it, though. I thought he did a pretty good job. I'll agree that I don't think he had as much chemistry with the lead actress in it. It's the worst kiss in the world. Oh, my God. But as far as, like, playing somebody who's kind of out of water, you kind of believe he's from a different culture, which he is, and then you kind of believe that he's a really normal guy who's just been thrown into the situation of, like, where he's at is strictly, like, a product of the time. He totally sold that. Yeah, he just completely sold that, where it's just war was happening, that was the thing to do, went and did it. And there's nothing else behind that. Totally sold that. And then all of his motives and what he wanted to do were completely sold too. I thought he did a really good job. And actually, I don't know, the accent doesn't really throw me off at all. I don't know, you guys. I think that happens a lot more than either of you think. Like, either Brooklyn or Italian accent. Like, there's so many actors who come out of that, though. Oh, yeah. Well, it's not specifically the accent. It's just the kind of low, slurring I couldn't not think of Sylvester Stallone while I was watching. I was like, "That oh, okay. he's trying to like... sound like Sylvester Stallone. And he's not. That is how he sounds. That is how Michael Perret sounds normally. 
I thought it was absolutely adorable when he was playing around with that speak and spell uh, alarm clock. But yeah, there's so many actors with that accent. But I can see how if you're like, Sylvester Stallone, Sylvester Stallone, Sylvester Stallone. Oh my God, it's a young Sylvester Stallone from the 40s. That could be distracting. Yeah, <laughs> and I think a lot of people just don't understand that. Yeah, that's why they hired him, because he's just like that. He's just like Sylvester Stallone. And also, like, I think that's something that a lot of period movies tend to do, especially around World War II, is they really tend to cast people showing them from like different neighborhoods different regions get the Brooklyn accent yeah a very yeah. clear identity of their accent and their ethnicity being thrown together on a ship and so I think casting someone with an accent was perfect and they did that also with Bobby DeChico who played the other sailor too exactly I mean hell it's on the town you got Frank Sinatra yeah no, I think he was perfect for this role and I agree with you I don't think Michael Pere is a great actor but he's great when you just kind of let him be a natural character. He does have this really nice natural charisma to him. Mm -hmm. And when you just have him in situations where what would just a normal guy be like in this situation? He mm -hmm. actually pulls it off really well. I think the parts where he doesn't work are when he actually has to be like an actor actor. And again, that kiss. Oh my God, that was the worst kiss I've ever seen in a movie. We'll get to Nancy Allen. I have thoughts about Nancy Allen. <laughs> I like him in this role. He has this timeless quality to him. Yeah. Like, he could be a guy in the 80s, he could be a guy in the 20s, he could be a guy in the 50s. Mm -hmm. He's a New York guy. He's not a captain, he's not a scientist, he's not an engineer. He's just a sailor. He's just a sailor. Exactly. A normal guy who's been dropped into this thing that, from an experiment that even he didn't have a clue what was entirely going on. Oh, yeah. Just a shit job and he's got to get it done. Mm-hmm. And I like how he did moments like when he goes to the old family garage and finds out what happened to his dad, mm -hmm. where he's sad that his dad is dead, but he's also kind of happy that his dad went and lived the dream and got to do all these things that he said he wanted to do. He's just sad that he didn't get to share that with him. Right. You know, and he really convinced me when he was breaking up in the car or like when he goes to track down the wife of Jim and it's like, Jim, don't you know me? And like the guy just can't talk to him. Yeah. I thought Pere was actually a really nice... I'm kind of surprised that he didn't catch on more than he did. Yeah, yeah. I was going to kind of say the same thing. Because Pere reminds me a lot of Channing Tatum. Okay. They have a similar quality to them. I can see that. And to be fair, Channing Tatum struggled for a long time. Oh, yeah. Because people just didn't really take him seriously because they just saw him as kind of a lunk-headed, every man all stuff. And it's not until the last few years that he's really taken off. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of a shame that Pere never got out of that hump. He needed to be in Jupiter Ascending. He needed his magic mic. Why don't we then go just jump over to the other side of the uh, romance, Nancy Allen as Allison Hayes. I didn't mind her at all. It's just, oh my god, that kiss. It was like when you have a kid playing with two Barbies and they're just mashing the faces together. Yeah. It's like any which way. That's what that <laughs> looked like. It's like, ooh. See, Nancy Allen, I don't dislike her as an actress, but there are a lot of films that she does where I just don't quite gel with her performance. She does just come off oddly disconnected at times. Mm -hmm. She did kind of feel disconnected. You have a, a guy stealing a car at gunpoint and she's like, oh my God, what? Really? Well, really? it's like, oh, it's like it's in the eyes. She's expressing a lot of emotion except through her eyes, which are just coming off really flat. Mm. And, I, and I've had that a lot with her because she used to be Brian De Palma's wife and was in a ton of his films. She was in RoboCop. Mm. I get that in a lot of her movies. I don't think she's a bad actress. She was in RoboCop. She was the partner. Yeah. That's where I recognized her from. Okay. It does seem like some of those things are just little ticks that seem to happen quite a lot in movies back then, where a lot more physical acting, but sometimes the reactions wouldn't be, well, they wouldn't be written realistically to begin with. And then just, right. yeah, sometimes the eyes. A lot of the scenes together, it's like, on paper, I liked it. The chemistry just wasn't clicking for me between them. Mm -hmm. And then I also didn't really feel that she really had much of a story. She kind of was just following him along for most of it. Right. It's like she had an interesting setup where, you know, she sold her home, packed everything in her car to move across the country to get a job with this guy that she was dating. And then he both dumps her and gives a job to someone else, leaving her stranded. And then we don't really get any follow up on that in terms of a character arc or anything. Well, there was like at least a couple of great character moments or something where, where she just stays with him. And the one point where he says that he needs her, maybe they could have gone into that more of like what kind of person just picks up a stranger at gunpoint and then just keeps on with him and keeps trying to help him out. 
For me, I think they did the whole bit where they get arrested by the cops and she just decides not to press charges too early. Mm -hmm. And no, I'm sorry, you can't just drop charges on someone kidnapping you with a firearm. That's a federal offense. Yeah, you kind of needed to sell that a little bit more and spend a little bit more time with her. You needed more time of them growing this relationship. I mean, you have like perfect opportunities where she's realizing that something is not right here Mm -hmm. in terms of the electrical flares of energy, the best friend disappearing, all that stuff. So it's like you had these moments. But I don't know, I just, it didn't fully feel like they fully figured out how to deliver it. Mm -hmm. But I do like that scene in the hotel where he's just flipping out and throwing the phone and just is like, I don't understand anything. And she actually gets scared and is like, I'm going to leave. And he apologizes and she says, okay, let's, let's just talk this out, see it through. I like those moments. And like even the moment where she sees his picture at the gas station and it suddenly clicks, okay, this is really happening. Mm Mm-hmm. But it's like they didn't fully sell for me that she still had many doubts. I don't know. It's like I like what the film is trying to do. It just never fully sold me on it. Right. I will say to his credit, I like that with their ending romance. It feels like they do have like some doubts about their relationship and where it could go. But, you know, they just want to be together. Like I thought that was a nice realistic way to play that off. Like, too often you get in Hollywood movies where they overcome the big bad thing, and then it's like, oh, now your love is forever. I do actually think that they earn that moment where, no, he just jumps back into the vortex and comes back to the present. See, I thought the entire time they were leading up to a big heroic sacrifice, he was going to die there, that they were kind of intimating that. It actually kind of disappointed me that they went back, and I was like, nope, I'm going to go and get me the girl. Yeah, no, I kind of got that sense, too. Like, I was wondering if he was going to sacrifice himself, and uh, I thought the fake-out was pretty well played, where he's like, oh, maybe I'll come see you sometime, and, you know, you're imagining, like, he's going to come back as an old man and visit her, but he's just, like, realized he already had it in mind that he's just going to jump back and see if he can be with her. What I meant was, is, like, some of their conversations in the car are, do you want to get married? And she's just like, oh, I'm not really sure. And it doesn't sound like he's not, you know, necessarily sure about her or he's not even like fully taking in what she says or necessarily believes what she says or even just thinks that she's a little bit full of bullshit with what else she's talking about. But when he jumps back, it's just that he wants to be with her. He's not yeah. sure that's going to work out. That's what makes it that much cooler that he just jumped back through. Yeah, I actually do like that. Even though, you know, it could have meant being terribly torn apart in time or being fused inside the deck of a ship. I'm glad they didn't overplay the whole time difference between them. Mm-hmm. Like, I like how it's these little moments where it's just awkward bits of he's not sure what the actual social politics of relationships are. Right. You know, in terms of sex and marriage and, and kids and all that. And also just little moments like when she opens the can of soda and he's like, how did you do that? Mm -hmm. There was a lot of honesty there. I thought, again, that whole moment where he was playing around with that talking alarm clock. And I like that they kept it as little moments. They didn't make an entire film about culture clash. And, well, there's the the trans person in the jail. So that was a bit, which to be fair, they had cross-dressers back in the 40s, too. Yeah. That was a strange scene. Yeah. But I like the punks at the gas station, Mm -hmm. you know, where it's just this quick little moment. And even then, the punks aren't mean to him. They're just like, hey, how's it going? You know, a little more honest where he's just not sure what to think. Oh, yeah. And where the film could have just as easily had him, like, rail off at them or whatever and telling them to, like, shave and get a collared shirt on or something. But it didn't take that. That was pretty good. I like that their reactions were so vague about it. Like, even when they're watching the television, which has, like, the violent movie on. Humanoids from the deep. Yeah. (laughs) You're not really sure what they're thinking. And they're just like, what the fuck is this? That's what I love is their expression is, I don't know what to think. Yeah, yeah. I like that rather than, you know. They weren't going around like, what is this? What is this? What is going on? But I like how they quietly did that of the first thing they find is a bottle of German beer. Yeah. yeah, that was that was a neat. And then they find a wreck of a car and it's a German car. What does this mean? Right, right. Oh no, but it's okay because this is a Coke. And then I like <laughs> even the bit at the bar where it's a Japanese biker sits down next to him and asks for the sweet and low. Mm-hmm. And it's just like he has so many things that he doesn't know how to process. What is this? Right, right. The film is at its best when it's doing that. And I think mm-hmm. it actually does that really well. It was very restrained. And that was to its credit. Yeah. And that's why I guess I would recommend the film based on if that is your candy, that you want to see really different characters thrown in together, go watch this movie. If you really want like a sci-fi adventure movie, maybe there's other ones you could watch. But if you want that, and if you kind of want the one where how weird your culture would be to someone who has never experienced anything like it, that's a good movie for it. I'll give you that. I just still didn't believe the romance. But again, yeah, these are great moments. I thought the story was done well for the romance. Like a lot of those little things about and and just how much honesty was in it. But again, just the chemistry wasn't quite broad. 
I don't know. It's like the point where they make love. It just feels like they're doing it because that's yeah. the point in the script where they're supposed to. Yeah. The horses kind yeah, of does. watching and doing that. Hey, dude, check this out thing was a little much. <laughs> well, okay. The ho- okay. Because <laughs> when I saw it with the horses, I thought one of them was going to the other. It was just kind of like, hey, do you want to snuggle too? And the other horse is just like, whatever. <laughs> I mean, if I'm going to anthropomorphize what they were doing. Cutting to the horses creeping on them was a little weird. Yeah. yeah. Or it could be that they're creeping on them. That works too. (laughs) That was not a well thought out cutaway. Yeah. Yeah. It made us lock on to that a little bit too much. I actually almost think if you had cut the sex scene, I could actually buy it more as just this bond between them. And then it culminates in him coming back and them finally sharing a kiss there at the end. Yeah, no, I I agree. I think that actually would have probably strengthened the romance because honestly, it's just the fact that they went that far at the point that they did. It just didn't feel like the natural progression of where they were going. Right. And then it just kind of felt like things kind of then took a weird slope out from there. But then again, that's because the entire third act just kind of feels slapped together, too. Mm hmm. Let's talk about the whole time vortex thing and some of the effects that they did for that. The whole overexposure kind of, um, how do you describe that camera thing? Where they did the filters on. Basically, it was like someone sitting there with a tint knob, turning it on and off, on and off. Mm -hmm. That was a little weird, but I mean, you had what you had access to at the time. And so it was like. It's not a terrible effect. It's just one that I had seen in the 1950s. Right. And it just kind of felt a little oddly out of place here. I didn't mind like the actual vortex effects. But we didn't get much of them. It was consistent, and I liked the fact that when he came back in the copper shielded suit, everybody had that effect on them except for him, and he was Mm -hmm. in normal color because he was shielded from that. I thought that was a neat little touch. He was doing the tint on and off, too, on his end. When he came back on the thing? When he was on the ship talking to Jim? After he took his helmet off, yeah, but before then he was just in normal color. That's actually what I didn't get is that he was able to come back through the vortex without the helmet. He just kind of forgot that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also Michael Pere in a spacesuit swinging an axe through an entire room full of light bulbs. Oh, yeah, the vacuum tubes. Couldn't he have just pulled the switch instead of gone through all that hole? No. Like, I'm going to smash. This is a movie. Smash, no. smash, if you're going to set up an entire room full of light bulbs, you are going to smash an entire room full of light bulbs. I am perfectly fine with that. Yeah, and, you know, it makes the scene last a little bit longer, helps you get out that just shutting down those generators. <laughs> you're just, you're sure he's doing it. <laughs> Instead of just flicking that switch. He's literally having a smashing success. Oh. Sorry. One of my other major problems is I don't feel they justified the way the military pursued him. Oh my god. I was waiting to bring that up because, oh my god. Because Longstreet is like, can you just bring him in? I just need to talk to him. And then this one... shooting at him. This one major guy just brings out his entire team of SUVs and are like shooting at him and chasing him down. And and like you even get like the big car chase, which ends in a car full of just soldiers blowing up. And on that note... What's his face, David? He could have solved so many of these problems because wasn't he looking for the military in the first place? And then the military showed up and he runs. Exactly. Exactly. And it's like, I blame the major because it's like he's the one who's overreacting, but it's like they never call him out on it. And it's like, in the end, him and David are just even share a little moment. Even that final thing is like the whole thing was... They were trying to get him into the base. He was trying to get into the base. And they were still shooting at each other. Yeah. It was like, you're both doing exactly what you wanted them to do. And you're still shooting at each other. And I get that in the beginning, it was because they thought that these were just two guys who were intruders on the base and they blew up that helicopter. Right. But even then, he knew he was trying to get to the military. Within like 10, 15 more minutes of the movie, Longstreet is like, okay, I figured out who this is now. And this is the part that he plays in this. Can you bring him in for me? Right. Yeah, it just... To the point where they flip somebody's Jeep and then it explodes for no reason, (laughs) killing everybody inside. But it's like they don't even use those moments where their people have been killed in the helicopter and in the Jeep. The people in the Jeep died for no reason. They died for no reason. And the Jeep shouldn't have even blown up in the first place. And yet there was still (laughs) no dramatic play of this is their motive for why they're so intent on getting this guy. Right. They're chasing him because he's running. I get that. He's running for whatever stupid reason he's running. But he's running toward them, and they're running toward him to push him away. From, it, it's. But then he's running away from them, <laughs> and they're shooting at so him. So he can go around the other way and run toward 
It's a weird... That was way too forced. That's the biggest part where the script breaks down for me. That was my biggest problem watching it was that, and oh my god, I was waiting forever for you to bring, or somebody to bring the conversation to go that way because oh my god. No, I, I pretty much agree. I mean, if some point in the movie the Major just clapped down his shoulder and was like, hey... Come on into the military base. He would have been thrilled. You know, he would have just come right with them. Say his name. Look, you know what his name is. Say his name. And, then he'd, and he'd be Say like, his name. you know who I am? And he'd be like, yeah. yeah, we know who you are. We've got the guy that you're looking for. Come with us. That would have solved like 45 minutes of that movie. And it's weird that David wants to go to the Navy and yet he keeps freaking out every time he sees someone in Navy uniform. Like there's a scene in the elevator where it's him and the, and the Navy guy or in the Marine where it's like they're just kind of eyeing each other and it means like, look, I need to bring you in. And David just starts wailing on them. Yeah. That was a little unintentionally hilarious because he makes it on the elevator and they're staring at each other for two floors, even while the elevator door opens up and then closes again. And then all these other people in the elevator are like, what's going on? And they're just staring at each other. That I'm sure that was not meant to be a funny moment, but I was laughing at that. That was hilarious. That is one of the big problems I have with this movie is that a large part of the plot just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. I like a lot of the individual scenes and sequences. It's just the story does not hold together very well. And then also like with Pam, the wife of Jim, in order to make it more dramatically relevant, it also had to be that she was also in love with David and they were just like deeply in love, but they ultimately didn't fall together and she married Jim, but they still have this close bond. And so that makes it more dramatic when he finds her in the future. It just felt like they were coming at it from a weird angle. Right, right. It didn't add anything. At all. You got enough dramatic punch there from her just being like a friend. Plus, then you still have Jim show up in the future. Right. Which I actually thought was a neat twist. Was he disappears and you think, did this guy just die? And then, no, we find out, oh, he actually went back in time and lived his life. I thought that was a nice little sci-fi twist. Nice. But then you have the whole thing of where he was convinced over so many years that he hallucinated all that and he just can't deal with it. That's something like in a TV show where then you would have him come back later. But in the movie, it, it was an odd note to end it on, but I kind of liked it. Especially that bit there where he's just taking a drink and his wife is like, why wouldn't you talk to him? And he's like, I, I just couldn't. I just couldn't. What could I tell him? Right. You could tell him that he figured out why the Coca-Cola cans are so light. <laughs> it's a film where I just, I like a lot of the parts. The score is fine, but it, like then you get this random moment where they just throw the song Runner in the Night on the soundtrack. Yes. I love that song, but where did that come from here? It felt like an odd choice. We have sound issues in our apartment where there's lots of kids and airplanes and stuff, so we usually watch movies with the subtitles on. And the subtitles made a huge point to point out that it was the song Runner in the Night. <laughs> <laughs> and like with the Philadelphia Experiment itself, it was a great setup. But then the ending, where it's like the ship comes back and everyone's fused into it, was just a little abrupt. Yeah. It went from cheesy sci-fi romance to all of a sudden that guy is embedded in the steel and gasping for breath. Like, holy crap. Sudden horror. Yeah, it felt like it was just trying to tie it to it, even though the story's over. We don't need to go into like that much detail. But I guess when the premise is to tie it into a popular urban legend, they felt like, gotta get that guy in the deck. I just had a thought. What if the way that he was supposed to sacrifice himself in the end was the ship is kind of destabilized and he literally has to push himself through a wall in order to do something inside a generator, mm -hmm. even though that means that as soon as you click back to reality, you're now stuck in that wall. That would have been a better movie. I think that would have been good if they really wanted to do the personal sacrifice one, but I don't think this movie would have earned that. I think this is a story where he goes back and sees his lady. But we have, you know, the romantic saves the day, cut to this horrible, horrible horror and young Longstreet looking on with a sad face and then cut back to happy ending. What that would need and also what the actual movie really did need was some throwaway line, even just as small as a throwaway line in the beginning of the movie or at some point where it was like, and by the way, a danger of this experiment may cause matter to destabilize and go through other matter. Just some way, it just felt like completely all of a sudden, boom, guy in the wall. How? Why? How? Like, I didn't know about the specific details of the uh, urban legend. I was just like, oh, it was just an urban legend about this ship that disappeared. I didn't know about the guy phasing through the steel deck. Yeah, people trapped in the deck was part of the original urban legend. And people yeah. who weren't familiar with that was like, why did we suddenly go to, like, Hellraiser here? What What's going on? 
Exactly. I know what you're saying. Like, it's kind of weird where it's horror and then goes back to love story. I'm just saying that I think that they should have played that differently. Like, either really minimize the wounds for But just it. a throwaway line. Yeah, something like that. Or do something earlier. There's a possibility that this may happen. Just one line, one sentence in the script. That would have been like, okay, and now it's a callback to that. Like, oh, now we know that that is a possibility of something that happened instead of just all of a sudden, boom, guy in the wall. Maybe remove the bit where they're all singed and scorched, too. Yeah, or just have, like, some people with, like, some burns or some people are sick, but have it mostly looking fine. Because it's still, it's, it's a fantasy story. You know, it's not the same as glossing over history or anything. Minimize that, and then, I don't know, maybe actually work that moment where someone's, like, fusing into deck. Like, you could have it be that when he goes back in time, he sees that, like, his friend Jim is, like, starting to, like, sink into the deck, and he runs back into the generator, and then Jim is fine after he shuts it off or whatever. Like, he phases back out. Something like that, because that would have at least had immediacy to the plot and him resolving the situation. And it would have been scarier, too. What if when he met Jim in the present, the elderly Jim... Jim is a double amputee because both of his legs had been fused in and had to be cut off. And when he goes back and saves Jim, he's able to pull him up out of the deck so that doesn't happen. That would have worked better, too. That would have worked well. I did like that the movie was a closed time loop. Like, there was no weird... Mm -hmm. um, I've uh, never been a fan of the closed time loop. No, but still, <laughs> it, was, it didn't make a whole big deal about paradox. It was consistent. The fact that it didn't make a big deal of you're changing the past. Like, no, it's already happened. Yeah. If they had brought in the whole paradox and changing the past, it would have complicated a movie that was already way too unnecessarily complicated. What with all the people shooting at each other for no reason. I'm just trying to think of how you could... My main problem with the whole deck thing is they didn't dramatically work it into the narrative. Exactly. It's just an image. It's just boom. It's like in the Venture Brothers, like Rusty Venture's got the walking eye for no reason other than the fact that there's a walking eye. It's like, walking eye, Hank. Why do we have walking eye? <laughs> and again, this is just my main problem with the climax. It's a lot of stuff slapped together. I mean, like you had the entire bit where the entire town is on fire. Mm -hmm. That's literally because they found a part of town which was going to be demolished. They were like, hey, can we light it on fire for our movie? Right. But it doesn't really, I mean, I understand with the vortex and all that stuff, but it doesn't really mean anything to the movie. Yeah. It's just, let's light a town on fire. The whole movie, we said this, it's a bunch of unconnected things that should have been woven together better. Yeah. I will say first and second acts of the movie, I'm perfectly fine with, with the exception of the whole military chasing after him. That could have been worked better. And I still have some problems with the romance. But for the most part, that's a perfectly serviceable, perfectly working movie. But then once you add the third act, they came up with the vortex stuff in the third act. So now we need to start rolling that into the earlier acts to set it up. So you just have these storms going on all over the place. It just doesn't hold together for me. Maybe it would have held together better that like, have David know that something's going wrong and wants to try to stop the experiment, but maybe like the military knows immediately that he was this guy, but instead of assuming that he can help us with the experiment, they're like, oh, maybe the Russians have something to do with this. And so they're chasing him just for that reason. That would be a real conflict. Do a conflict between Longstreet and the military guy. There's an actual conflict between Longstreet and the military over how to deal with this. Exactly. And then when they hear the story, they don't believe him just because they're so afraid of the Russians. I don't know. Just you need a conflict. Actually, on that topic... Maybe now I should bring in Starman. Yes. Starman actually came out the same year as this movie, but it was the movie John Carpenter made four years after his time working on this. And while it's very much its own movie, I think there's just so many similarities in terms of a fish out of water guy kidnaps a woman, but then they end up falling in love while going on the road. He's struggling with little moments of dealing with modern day civilization on Earth while also constantly being chased by the military. Yet there's a scientist who's like, no, we need him in order to solve the solution. There's so many parallels and similarities, just even on a broad point. Oh, yeah. They even have a love scene out around the same point in the movie. Right, right. And that one feels a lot more earned just because of a lot of the plot points in it. I really like Starman, and I would absolutely recommend it. I think it did do a lot of things that Philadelphia Experiment tried to do, and that did well, but like Starman did them a lot, lot better. It's one of my mom's favorite movies. And Kevin, to your memories of Starman, do you recommend it or not? Keeping in mind that I haven't seen Starman in like over 10 years, I really liked it when I saw it. It was really good. It held together really well. And again, it's one of my mom's favorite movies, and she doesn't really like movies that suck. Okay. 
I mean, she does, but, you know, the same way that everybody else does. But yeah, no, Julie, I'm, I'm actually glad you really enjoyed it. It feels like Philadelphia Experiment is almost kind of like an early draft of a lot of ideas mm-hmm. that Carpenter ultimately perfected there. And I know the whole road trip romance aspect was something that he specifically brought to Starman. I'm wondering how much of that then originated from him while developing Philadelphia Experiment. Right. Because, I mean, Philadelphia Experiment does have a very unique angle with the person from the past and the future. It's a very different perspective than the alien. Right. But it's still following a very similar train of thought. It feels like the best parts of the movie are where he's with her in that journey. And they both do feel like movies where it's more of the journey rather than the end goal. But the problem with Philadelphia Experiment is, is like there's just nothing to really tie some of that together. And Starman, it's perfect. And especially, I love that the opening scenes of it completely tie in with the rest of the movie where it's like, we invited him here. But then when he tries to come to scout at the planet, finds out that it's hostile. And he's like, oh, shit, can't do this. Got to go home. And it's like he decides that within the first 10 minutes that, nope, ain't going to be visiting these aliens anytime soon. And I think that like completely ties together because you know exactly what his problem is going to be the entire time. It's a reasonable one. It's obviously believable Mm -hmm. because that's what we would do. And we did send out the Voyager 2. I'm going to say it's just... um, It holds together so much better. It holds together so much better. And then it immediately ties into that theme of like, you think your culture means something, but to somebody else, your culture is noise. All culture is noise. And it doesn't necessarily make sense. Just the whole thing of like, we invited them, we wanted to see an alien, but we totally weren't ready to receive any. It's almost like we didn't think anyone would ever try to contact us. But then when one does, we try to shoot them down. That's why you have the scientist military conflict to give voice to all that. Exactly. Whereas you didn't get that in Philadelphia Experiment. Right. And then that just helps set up every other interaction that he has where a lot of people are very vicious to him, but a lot of people help him out too. Oh, yeah. Where he finds that mix of aggression and reaching out. Sometimes even the same people doing the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Like that first interaction with the Voyager gets replayed again and again and again. And I just love that. I love any like quiet jabs to humanity. Not going to lie. I love it when sci-fi does that. (laughs) Yeah. And then I also love that the woman character in that movie, I can't remember her name at the moment. She has a complete character arc and journey of her own Mm -hmm. with the whole still dealing with her dead husband. How do I react to any of this? You know, they get separated and she has to go find him again. She's usually the one who's pulling him along and driving the action forward, driving the journey forward. Right. Even though she's not even sure she wants to be doing this. And what I love is that it doesn't ever fall into she's just basically using him as a proxy for her husband. Right. She's actually developing a relationship with this person in the form of her husband. Right, right. And in fact, the fact that he's in the form of her husband creeps her the fuck out. Yeah, no, exactly. And yeah, it's that mixture of like not knowing quite how to feel about this development. And it helps that they're both great actors, too. Yes. And it's just a really well put together movie. Jeff Bridges' performance is totally brilliant where... You almost feel like you can see him picking up things, but it's also vague enough that you don't know what his exact reactions are to stuff. And it doesn't go out of its way to overly celebrate something in like pop culture, because sometimes you'll find that in a lot of movies where like an alien sees some aspect of pop culture and they're like, that is fantastic. That doesn't really happen here except that apple pie. I love that he's not a perfect being. Yeah. He is confused. He's petulant at times. He's actually kind of pissy at times. Mm -hmm. He's completely out of his element and doesn't know what to do. Right. And it's like even little bits like where she whistles to get his attention. He's just like, what was what? Yeah. (laughs) And like the windshield wipers. You know, I, I love that he's not perfect space Jesus. He's just a guy from another planet. Right. He's smarter and he's higher than us, but he's still just as confused and perplexed as we are. Yeah, it's played where it's also very vague, but also you can clearly see an intelligence in there. And also just like someone who's totally foreign to culture, he doesn't even know what to focus on. Like he can't tell what's important in the background and what's not. Exactly. And he's picking up on things the way they are rather than... Picking up on the middle finger or saying shit or the red light. Yeah, green light means go... Yeah, well, it means go really fast. Like how a kid observing things for the first time. And I thought he played that amazingly. I really like how they build the journey. You feel the relationship growing between them. You feel a progression of them. They have a clear place where they are going. And the military is following them along that line. 
as opposed to they all just want to go to the same. It, there, there is a genuine progression of events. Right. Which is my main problem with Philadelphia Experiment. It doesn't feel like a genuine progression of events. Mm-hmm. Do you see why I wanted to bring it up for this episode? Oh, absolutely. There's such a tie between them. A lot of the charms of both are like really seen. Like Philadelphia Experiment does have a lot of that kind of culture shock and kind of played in sort of the same way. And then the whole road trip journey and the love story played the same way. It's just Starman does it so much better. Yeah. I would be curious to have seen what Carpenter's version of Philadelphia Experiment would have been like. Mm-hmm. God, imagine if he had gotten Kurt Russell to star that. Ooh. Kurt Russell and Adrian Barbeau. Let me just throw that out there. Mm. <laughs> but again, he didn't know how to end the movie. And you can't really use Starman as how he would have ended it because that third oh, yeah. act in Starman is very much of that alien story as opposed to a time traveler story. Exactly. Though, one of my favorite touches of Starman is that the beginning of the movie is his point of view taking in our planet as he comes to Earth. Right. And the last shot of the movie is his point of view leaving the planet, but all he's looking at is her. Yeah. I could picture something involving the vortex and David, you know, his last vision, you know. He finally found where to focus. Yes. So between Philadelphia and Experiment and Starman, if you had to pick one. Oh, Starman. Starman, easily. Same here. Though I am still glad to have finally revisited, because Philadelphia Experiment is one of those films I've always heard about. I would always catch parts of it on TV. I know it's one of my mom's favorite movies, much like it is with Kevin's mom and Starman. It's just always been around, and I've always liked the concept, and I still like the concept. I still like the idea, and it does do a lot of things right. It does. Mm -hmm. I still don't recommend the movie, ultimately, but it's one of those ones that if it's on TV catch it yeah sure catch it you know if you want to throw something on for a weekend it's just not a film i feel people need to go out of their way to see like look if you need more kate leopold go see starman after you need more starman you go see philadelphia experiment i don't know if that's rude to rank them but if you really like one of those movies go check out the other three absolutely i like that train of thought (laughs) it's also one of those ones if the idea of the movie the setup of the movie sounds intriguing to you Yeah, go ahead for it. You'll get enough building on that idea to at least make an entertaining experience. If you're watching TV on Sunday and the WGN Sunday movie comes on and it's this instead of Little Shop of Horrors, go ahead and watch it. Yeah, my main thing, though, is that Philadelphia Experiment, it's like, yeah, go see it within this parameter of qualifiers. Starman, it's like, just go see it. It's a good movie. It's true. It's true. It's interesting that for a film that he is not credited for directing, that he's not credited for writing, he only has this one executive producer credit and he only did some development work on it for a while. There's still such a similar through line between those two. Oh, yeah. Just one last point. Laura and I have never met anybody who didn't like Starman. Wait till you listen to our episode. (laughs) Okay, well, then somebody didn't like Starman. Yeah, someone was on the fence about Starman. And you know what? Ask that person if they like apple pie. (laughs) <laughs> Actually, listen to the episode. That does come up. <laughs> <laughs> Laura was uh, checking it out of the library, and the librarian was like, oh my god, I love this movie. Just, just randomly out of the blue. And Starman is also like Philadelphia Experiment. It's always been on TV. Mm-hmm. It's always been on TV. Ever since, like a couple years it came out, and even nowadays, you can still see it on TV every now. I think I just saw it on TV a couple weeks ago. Nice. And it's still interesting that these two movies still came out in the same year within four months of each other. Wow. It's just an interesting through line. And then, as I said in the episode, what's also fascinating is John Carpenter left Philadelphia Experiment and did Starman, and the director, John Badham, left Starman and made Short Circuit. Hmm. Which is, again, an oddball inhuman individual kidnaps a woman, they kind of go on a road trip, the government chasing after them. Oh, that's right. So there's an interesting direct through line between those three movies. Short Circuit, very different movie. (laughs) I like Short Circuit. I do, too. We've talked about Short Circuit recently. Fisher Stevens aside. Yeah. (laughs) It almost makes up for it by having Steve Gutenberg. Yeah. So I just wanted to just take a few minutes here to run you guys through the sequel and the remake. Ready. Philadelphia Experiment Part 2 was released by Tramark Entertainment on November 12, 1993, over nine years after the first movie. Whoa. It actually did get a limited theatrical release. It was released in two theaters. Uh, Okay. And then went straight to video. Damn. (laughs) The lead character is the same. It's still David Herdeg, but it's completely recast. None of the same crew. The only crew that came back was producer Douglas Curtis. The film was written by Kim Steven Kittleson, whose only other credit is a single Tales from the Crypt episode. Kevin Rock, who wrote a bunch of Warlock and Howling sequels and the unreleased Roger Corman Fantastic Four movie and was the story editor of the anthology series Perversions of Science. And was also written by Nick Payne, whose only other credit is the third installment of the Josh Kirby Time Warrior direct-to-video franchise, which was actually a fun kid series. Time Warrior. 
And then director Stephen Cornwell directed the forgotten TV action movies State of Fear, Killing Street, and Martial Law, and then recently made a comeback as the writer of the Liam Neeson thriller Unknown, and the, the last film by Philip Seymour Hoffman, A Most Wanted Man. The basic setup of the plot is it's set nine years later, where Allison has died. Oh. David is left now as a single father of their son. Despite the fact that he's been living in the modern age for nine years, he still doesn't relate to his son because he doesn't understand modern pop culture. He doesn't know who Terminator is. He doesn't oh. know who Predator is. He doesn't know who Robocop is, all of which are references that come up in the movie. Oh my. The only way he can relate to his son is through baseball. This is quite the turn. Yeah, it is. And it's like has sad moments where they're all longing and it's like the house is in foreclosure or they're going to lose the house because they're bankrupt. But it's like him and his son then go out and play a game of catch and they're good. But then the big twist is that the experiment has been started again, resulting in a stealth bomber being accidentally sent back to Nazi Germany and the Nazis captured it and used it to win World War II. So it's created an alternate present timeline where the Nazis won and occupied America. And David, because of his exposure to the experiment, is the only person unaffected by the timeline. It's literally his reality blinks into this new existence. And the movie doesn't end there. No, no, no. That's the beginning. That's the setup. Oh, okay. So it's him cooking up with a group of gorillas who are led by Longstreet, who is still in here, though, again, a different actor. And he needs to go in and literally go back, blow up the stealth bomber before it can be used. And then hopefully when he comes back to the present, it'll be his present again. It'll undo the change to the present. What's incredibly shocking about this movie is it's actually a really darn good movie. <laughs> really? Okay. It is. It's kind of a silly setup, but it plays it like a Twilight Zone episode or an Outer Limits episode where they had a very low budget, so it's more focused on style and atmosphere, philosophical conflicts. That seems okay. The main bad guy is actually really well played as basically a corporate guy who sold out to the Nazis. Uh -huh. There's even a great scene where David gets into the bad guy's lair and the bad guy just hands him a gun and says, look, shoot me, shoot me. But you know, that's not going to change anything. You need to work with me. Only with me are you going to be able to change things. Because hmm. the bad guy is obsessed with also going through the experiment so that any other further changes to the timeline won't affect him in the way they do David. And he wants to profit off of that. Gotcha. So he wants David to save the day. That sounds like a really good plot line. It is. And David actually has this really nice relationship with a woman who leads the guerrilla fighters, who is a black woman in Nazi-occupied America. It's very much like the relationship between Captain America and Peggy Carter, and nothing really comes of it. And it tragically ends before they can ever really come together. But there's this really great chemistry between them, and it's just kind of a really touching, sad relationship. Okay. It's a surprisingly clever movie. It's a bit clunky. The dialogue is a little clunky. It is very cheaply made. But for its budget, it's actually really cleverly put together. The plot doesn't always go where I expect it to go, especially in the climax. It takes some really nice twists. The lead actor that they get, his name is Brad Johnson. He's kind of flat, kind of dull, but he's not a bad replacement for Michael Perret. Mm -hmm. And the main villain, played by Garrett Graham, who usually does comedic roles, he is just so... he's delicious. He is just a delicious, evil bad guy. A lot of the film, every time we cut to him, he's trying to make a propaganda film and he's trying to find the right music for it. So it's like every time we cut in, he's got like a wildly different soundtrack that he's trying to do. He even brings in a live country band. He's going through all the classical composers. It's just this really weirdly staged thing. But again, it's like it plays like a Twilight Zone episode. It has that atmosphere. It has that stylishness that even though it doesn't always completely make sense, it makes sense as kind of an almost allegorical parable type story. Okay. I really recommend it, especially if you enjoyed the first one and you want to follow up. It's a bit grimmer, but it's not like overly brutal. And it, it is a continuation. It does actually pick up a lot of the threads. But it also then takes the story in a different direction with the whole, instead of going back to the past, we'll go to a parallel present. Okay. And then there was the remake, which is kind of a remake, but kind of not. It's not an official remake. It was a remake made for the Sci-Fi Channel in 2012. It is a Sci-Fi Channel movie. <laughs> It's one of those kind of mockbusters where they're basically doing a ripoff remake where it's not an officially licensed remake, but it is essentially the exact same movie. Is it still called Philadelphia Experiment? It's still called Philadelphia Experiment, and I'll get into the plot in a second, but in terms of the people who made it, writer Andy Briggs also wrote Screaming Night, Rise of the Gargoyles, Ghost Town, Dark Relic, and Legendary Tomb of the Dragon. 
and I had fun time going through this list of titles. Director Paul Ziller has 25 years worth of exploitation films to his name, including Pledge Night, Blood Fist 4, Virtual Seduction, Shoot Fighter 2, which means that there is a Shoot Fighter 1 out there somewhere. <laughs> Snakehead Terror, Ugh. Bear With Me, as in the animal bear, Bear With Me. <laughs> <laughs> Actual film that exists. Solar Attack, Yeti Curse of the Snow Demon, Iron Golem, Collision Earth, Android Apocalypse, yeah. and Stonehenge Apocalypse. Stonehenge Apocalypse. Yes, he's the director of the infamous Stonehenge Apocalypse, and he also directed episodes of Stargate Atlantis and Highlander the series. Oh, yes. And, you know, as much as I love those titles, nothing warms my heart like a good blood fist. <laughs> and to be fair, that was one of the blood fists that I got to when I was doing my Don the Dragon series. That was actually a pretty good one. Blood fist. Oh, blood. I need to get back on the Don the Dragon movies. I miss those. Anyways, the remake is basically the same story. The experiment goes off. One of the soldiers gets trapped in the present. The difference, though, is that the woman that he hooks up with, instead of a romance, is his granddaughter. So it's actually this kind of familial connection as he learns about all this. You know, his wife went on to have a long life. His daughter went on to have a long life. But he never got to live any of that with him. And so it's this kind of strain as he's the distant family member who comes back from the past while struggling to connect with the present. It, they actually do an interesting job with that. The actors all suck. The writing sucks. The plot is just completely nonsensical with the actual USS Eldridge, the ship is continuing to jump to place to place on Earth, where it's like, okay, imagine a sci-fi channel movie where a guy is on a runway taking off with an airplane, and suddenly a giant battleship shoots out of a wormhole and crashes into his airplane. To be fair, that sounds awesome. It sounds awesome. A little sad, though. But sci-fi channel level budget effects. <laughs> and then <laughs> it pops to Chicago, where it literally drops into the top of a building. And then it transports to the Sahara Desert. And every time it transports, the lead character goes through the big energy flares like he did in the original. Mm -hmm. Though what's funny is that he starts to figure out how to channel those flares. And so as the bad guys are pursuing him, he starts doing like Street Fighter style blue fireballs. He goes Saiyan. He's literally like shooting fireballs of space time of like Hadouken. Kamehameha. <laughs> yes. And then the bad guys, it's a corporation that has taken over the experiment. And it's all setting up a point where he has to get back on the ship and shut down the generators like he did the last time. The woman who leads the corporation just wants to blow the damn ship up so it'll go away. But every time she shoots things at it, it just makes the experiment go bigger. And yet she keeps trying to shoot at it. And there's a scientist working with her who's basically like the scientist character in Starman who's like, will you just listen to me and stop trying to shoot it? And she keeps trying to shoot it. And the person chasing after him is a cold-blooded hitman played by Michael Pere. Nice. And he's actually really good as a Stone Cold Killer. I would love to see him do that role. And then at some point, Malcolm McDowell shows up for a scene because they promised him he could drive a speedboat. Hmm. Well, when you want somebody who's vaguely threatening in an evil kind of way, you get Malcolm No, McDowell. he's actually the good guy. He's the scientist who Whoa. did the original experiment. Plot twist. And it's literally his scene he gets to drive a speedboat. And it's like, okay, I see why he signed up. It's not a terrible movie. It's not unwatchable. It's just, it's one of those sci-fi channel movies where it feels like something that they just threw together in a week. To be fair, they probably did. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it just feels very rushed, very choppy. The script is very loose, kind of messy. The direction isn't terrible, but it, there's nothing really particularly good about it. The cast is not terrible, but there's nothing particularly good about them. So basically the only way it would be more of a sci-fi original movie is if it had Ron Perlman or Dean Cain in it. And a giant octopus. Yeah. <laughs> Like, the reason the Philadelphia experiment went bad was because a giant octopus appeared, and that's been pulled to the present, too, and is zapping all over the country. Please, it's the portal monster. Come on. It is entertaining, <laughs> effects aside, seeing a ship literally just punching things as it appears in place to place. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's not a good movie. It had some neat ideas. It did have some neat ideas. It actually folded in some of Starman in nice ways, but it was just such a rush, cheap, shoddy job that I can't really recommend it. One final thing I want to mention is there was another film that came out in 1980 called The Final Countdown, where it's basically the inverse of Philadelphia Experiment, where it's a 1980s aircraft carrier gets zapped to the day before Pearl Harbor and is faced with the conundrum of, should we interfere? Right. I mainly just watched it because I've had it sitting on my shelf all this time. And I'm like, hey, it sounds similar. Let's see. 
And then I also found out that there's a manga series called Zapang, where it's basically the exact same plot from the point of view of a Japanese ship that gets zapped back to the day before Battle of Midway. Both of them are actually pretty interesting. Final Countdown, its main problem is that once the story gets rolling, it needs to resolve everything and then end. Zapang went on for 43 volumes, so they get to play out what actually happens when, even if you don't intend to, you start to get pulled into your new present, which is the past, and you can't really help it, because you're just stuck there for a long, long period of time, and you don't know how to go back. If you want a nice inverse of Philadelphia Experiment, I recommend Zapang. Otherwise, that's pretty much all I have. Any, any final thoughts from either you in terms of the entire Philadelphia Experiment overall? It was fun if you ignored all of the why are you shooting at each other moments. Yeah. Exactly. Like, holy shit. I mean, oh my... I mean, Lord, wasn't I saying that at the time? It was like, why are you shooting at each other? This movie would have been solved, like many movies, if everybody just talked to each other. Yeah. I do think Starman had a much better build of that because there was a longer stretch where nobody quite knew what they were dealing with. Right. And there was even a long stretch where in Starman, they didn't know that they were being pursued. And you can forgive a lot of stuff if you just go like, alien. Yeah. Yeah, that gives you a lot of leeway. But he was specifically looking for the military. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still stuck on that. And it's like also the whole thing that, oh, you had a gun and you pulled it on this. You, you have an entire restaurant full of people who would probably say, no, the guy who owned the restaurant was the one who pulled the gun on him. Exactly. He stole the gun from that guy. Mm -hmm. uh. That was actually a scene that I like where they're kidnapping her. And yet she's still largely in control of the situation in terms of like, look, I am not leaving without my bag. This car is literally everything that I own right now. You are not taking it. Right. And then I like how they're just like, uh, okay, get in, get in. Like, yeah, fuck it. I did enjoy the movie. It gave you stuff. It did. It gave you things. And yeah, I don't know, that kind of character type interaction is pretty rare. So, and I really enjoyed it. It just, there were so many things that it just didn't work for me, but I wouldn't keep getting the academic. Right, right, right. We, we did it. Recorded. We did it. We did it. <laughs> Cut, print. That's a wrap. <laughs> the job is done. <laughs> well, thank you both for joining me. Well, of course. Looking forward to uh, joining you next time when we do Shark Night. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for having me on. <laughs> Just as long as Shark Night isn't for the Sci Fi Channel. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, no, I'm just lost in thought about Shark Night again. Yeah, yeah, no, we need to, uh, yeah. It is, it's a concept that once you said those words... We need to focus it. Just, it. it writes itself in the brain. It really does. It's so good. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. I have a strange amount of knowledge about Michael Perret's career. Yeah, and I just realized that that's who you were talking about with some other things. And now, like, hmm, I might have words about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Igor and I covered an entire TV series starring him from the late 90s. Which was the TV series again? Star Hunter. Star Hunter. All right. And you said he was in Streets of Rage, right? Streets of Fire. Streets of Fire. And Eddie and the Cruisers. Okay, I'm sorry. Streets of Rage is a fighting game. Yes, that's the Sega Genesis beat em up to be fair, he might have been pretty good in that one, too. How do you know he wasn't? Oh, that's true. To be fair, Streets of Rage was a knockoff of the movie Streets of Fire. Well, there you go. Well, then there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Streets of Fire was like one of those movies that, like Road Warrior, everyone yep. in Japan saw. And half the anime made for the next decade, you can see Streets of Fire all over it. Yeah. Just like you can Road Warrior and Terminator. Just locked on. You know, this whole thing that came about from me being sick that one time last year is just <laughs> gone completely out of proportion, but you know what? Do we need to give you more cold medication? You, <laughs> I can go get some. No, it, 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 yeah, I wasn't even trying to do a voice the first time. It just for some reason slipped into it. And so now apparently for our purposes, I will be reading John Carpenter as Foghorn Leghorn. You have become our voice of John. <laughs> After we release the fog, I have one more picture <laughs> on my AFCO embassy. This has got to be so offensive to some, you somebody like, somewhere. <laughs> you sound like Colonel Sanders. I love it. 
I start I say I started writing the Philadelphia Experiment, which was a famous folk tale about this WW two invisibility <laughs> problem. <laughs> Don't laugh, you're making me break up. I had this great two act movie, but no third act. I couldn't end it. Bob Rainey, who was the head of AFCO, wanted another picture from me, so he asked. I don't even. I'm slipping my accent. <laughs> you weren't yeah. even going into Foghorn anymore. I was slipping anymore. into a little bit of Keanu. Yeah, I don't even Whoa. know where it's going at this point. <laughs> Three episodes from now, John Carpenter is going to be like Gary Oldman doing Zerk at some point, and none of it's going to no. be under my control. And we never heard from him again. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you sound just like John Carpenter normally anyways, which makes this even funnier. <laughs> you sound exactly how he sounds. Really? So I reached down into the trunk and came up with this thing I'd written right out of film school called Escape from New York. And Bob said, great, let's make it. I say that's not as funny, but probably less offensive. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine. Thank you. Thank you for your performance, Kevin. I think it's probably the end of my John Carpenter impersonations for the entire rest of this run. It's a good button to leave in it. A good good it's, button to put in. Yeah. <laughs> no regrets telling us that we can jump in at any time. <laughs> no, no, no regrets. Shark Knight is not a thing to regret. <laughs> never. Never. It's a little helmet. I like a little flounder squire. Let's see. Shark Knight, a great white in King Arthur's court. Oh. Yes. <laughs> You win. Uh, oh, nice. Can't be wrong if it feels so right. <laughs> All right, let's let's go ahead and move on from Shark Knight. Though I'm going to stew on that for a while. I should probably see Short Circuit again. And Batteries Not Included. Oh, man. I have never seen Batteries Not Included. It is amazing! <laughs> I only saw it once back when the Disney Channel was still a premium channel. We would get the holiday weekends. Right. Okay. So we would watch it as much as possible during the holiday weekend. And mm -hmm. that was on one time. And I was like, what is this? And it was really, really sweet and adorable. And I loved it. I liked it a lot. I need to check it out because it's actually one of Brad Bird's first movies. He wrote it. Oh, that does okay. not surprise me learning that that's a Brad Bird movie because that actually uh, fits a lot of the other movies that I know that he's done. I will need to check that out sometime. Actually, you know what movie I saw when Disney was a premium channel? Hmm. What? David Lynch's Dune. Oh, okay, yeah. There was a period where they played on Disney Channel David Lynch's Dune at like one in the morning, and mm -hmm. it was that extended cut that's like 40 minutes longer. Hmm. That was my first time seeing Dune at like age 10 at one o'clock in the morning on Disney. That was a strange time. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that was a simpler age. <laughs> Now they have, uh, they've got some Doctor Who on, and you should check out the commercials for oh, it. Yeah, oh, my those God. Are the most Did you see that on Tumblr? Ads I've ever seen. It's Doctor Who. It's Doctor Who. But no, they feel like how Fox Kids would have marketed Doctor Who <laughs> to, yes. to like, on like Saturday mornings if that it had does. ever happened. It, is... it does. Yeah, and I don't know. Slap some Doctor Who right next to Digimon. It's like Saban's Doctor Who. Yeah. <laughs> I love, oh. yeah, I, that commercial. Love it. Oh, God. Yeah, those have been wild. I've been catching those a lot. Uh, I'm actually in the minority of people who really, really like Short Circuit 2. Okay. Like, unabashedly, unashamedly, I love Short Circuit 2. Oh, I saw that one when I was a kid, but I haven't seen it since. What I'm fascinated by, both Short Circuit movies were written by the same guys who are the same guys who wrote the entire Tremors franchise. All four Tremors movies and every episode of the TV series. Well, wow. Good on them. I miss Tremors. Tremors is amazing. I actually loved the entire franchise. It was one of those ones where as the series kept going, I'm like, yeah, this is exactly where this should go. I've never seen the series, but I like every single one of the movies. Yeah, I've never seen the TV series either. I love that Bert is the same no matter what movie it is. Yeah. And the TV series is Bert. And it's just, it's just more Tremors. It's just God. more Tremors <laughs> every week. It picks up completely where the movies left off. I miss when Reba left after the first one. Oh, yeah. But did they ever explain why they left? They didn't get divorced, did they? Uh, I'm, like, I, I'm like asking as if it's like real people, and I'm very concerned. No, I think there was a line in part two where they broke up and she took half the arsenal. Oh, see, that's sad. I wanted... No, that's so sad. Okay, but anyway. Bert does start a new relationship as the series kept going. I'm sorry, Bert, Reba, OBTP, okay? There can't be another. There can't be. Anyway, no, you need to watch Batteries Not Included. I will. Yeah, watch Batteries Not Included. It'll melt your heart. I've actually owned it for a few years. You owned it and you didn't watch it? That's about half my DVD collection, yeah. Fair enough. I actually have the novelization as well because I'm me. Well, yeah. 
Anyway, so back to Philadelphia Experiment. We're still not done with the episode yet. <laughs> hey, right. We were doing a podcast. <laughs> oh. No, Sorry, excuse I was me. Out Olive time Garden time. talk right here. <laughs> <laughs> Infinite breadsticks. Infinite breadsticks. No, no. They charge now for every additional set of breadsticks you get. Ah. Oh. Do they? I don't know if they actually implemented that or not because they got so much bad publicity when they said they were going to. Uh, like, yeah, absolutely. Because theoretically, then every restaurant is an infinite food place. <laughs> <laughs> it's infinite, infinite, directly in, proportional infinite to the amount of place. money that you put in. Just, yeah, as long as I you I want to start a restaurant that's called Infinite Food <laughs> It's infinite food. That sounds like something Starman would title his restaurant. Your food is directly infinite food to your money. station. There was a brief time in the eighties when Old Country Buffet tried to rebrand. Yeah. <laughs> As infinite street. food, infinite food place. <laughs> well, well, with an asterisk there, and the asterisk is for a given value of food. So are you? <laughs> infinite <laughs> quotation mark As food. As long as you have money. <laughs> <laughs> All you can pay for. Infinite food. <laughs> <laughs> Brought to you by White Castle. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to be writing a comic book now that's called Shark Knight and the Adventure of Infinite Food. Yeah. Got it, because yes, that's exactly what a shark would pursue. You're a genius, Kevin. <laughs> that's his holy grail. The infinite food place. Yeah, his holy grail. The infinite food. I think we just hit on something here. <laughs>